right. Okay, good evening. Um, welcome to another uh, post on Rust Lab Coder Night. Uh, the subject of tonight's talk is high performance JavaScript. And the goal of this talk is to show you how to make JavaScript which runs fast. Um, I've drawn on a few different sources for this, including looking at how the um, virtual machines work in um, particularly in Chrome, a little bit in Internet Explorer as well. Um, and uh, what I'll do is basically I'll explain to you the principles you need to, to know so that your JavaScript goes quick. The first question to ask, of course, is why is JavaScript slow? Um, and once we understand this, we can look at what the tricks that various JavaScript runtimes run use. Um, and, we can, and if we know these tricks, we can then write our JavaScript so that um, we will get good performance out of the runtimes. So, why is JavaScript slow? It's pretty obvious, really. Uh, it's an inter typically an interpreted language. Um, although there are adjusting time compilers now, uh, which are very widely used, they say the comp compilation of JavaScript still takes time. As you're just downloading source code, um, you, you, some, rather than having stuff compiled ahead of time, you still, uh, the compilation still takes time. Uh, there is quite a lot of effort has gone into making JavaScript start quickly. And of course, the more work you do, like compilation ahead of time, the slower your startup will, will be. So even though we've got just-in-time compilers, there is still a balance to be struck between getting good startup by interpretation and getting good performance by running compilation. JavaScript is a very loosely typed language. You can do pretty much whatever you want um, with your objects. Um, this is very different to normal compiled languages. And the net result is that loose typing actually makes it very hard to generate good machine code. Runtime type modification, the same loose typing extends to when your JavaScript is actually running. You can add uh, methods to your classes at runtime. You can override them on individual instances. Um, you can do a lot of functional programming type tricks. But the net result is that JavaScript programs change as they run. The structure of the code changes as they run. And a fourth one, this very big one, is garbage collection. Um, JavaScript naturally generates a lot of garbage, it's, and the garbage collection can take a lot of time, and it stops your application while that's happening. So these, what we'll look at different ways of um, addressing these points. There's a fifth one that I'm going to add, which is I'm not going to talk about tonight, which is DOM manipulation. Uh, <laughs> and the reason is because this is not specific to JavaScript. This is um, when you do... Um, and obviously a lot of JavaScript programs do end up manipulating HTML, the DOM in the web browser. There are many tricks you, you need to do to do this effectively. We can perhaps do those, talk about some of those in questions at the end. But the fo main focus of the talk is on JavaScript language and getting the language to run fast, not about doing efficient DOM updates. So what tricks do the runtimes use? We're going to look into these in, in detail. Type tagging is a way of uh, representing uh, objects and uh, values efficiently in memory. Hidden classes copes with uh, some of the way that um, JavaScript types change. Speculative optimization means that the compilers or the virtual machines will make guesses about what's required to make your code run fast. Sometimes they're wrong and they have to de-optimize. The special treatment of certain, um, certain types, particularly um, arrays of numbers, arrays of constant time. Concurrent compilation is a technique used by um, Chakra in Internet Explorer 10, where it will compile your code in a separate thread while your code continues to execute interpreted in the main thread. And once the compiled code is ready, then it gets substituted into the main thread. You know, Chakra also has concurrent garbage collection, um, uh, meaning some of that goes on in the background. So first, type tagging. This, how do you represent a type in JavaScript? A, 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 um, a variable can contain pretty much any value. Um, a classic way you do it is you would have some sort of flag which says this contains a type, be it an object or a, a, uh, a double or an integer, uh, but that gets pretty inefficient. So classically, um, we use 32-bit integers and we set the lower bit to 1 if it's an object or 0 if it's an integer. These are so-called boxed. Um, sorry, unboxed types here, or tagged types. 
For things that don't fit in a 32-bit integer, we instead store a pointer to the actual value itself. This, this has many, uh, many nice effects, Not own, mainly that it means that a lot of the actual data exists as 32-bit values in your, in your program, in, which are very efficiently manipulated by the CPU. It avoids this dereference to get to the real value in the case of, in common cases. And what this means is that um, you can actually, in some cases, you can shortcut all the JavaScript um, uh, type variation. Take a simple add function that adds two numbers. When you actually compile it, what the virtual machine will often generate, it will check simply that both arguments to the function are, uh, are integers, which, if you remember, the small integers have a zero in the, um, in the low, least significant bit. So we test the least significant bit. If it's one, then it's not a small integer, and we, we do something else. Same for B. If they're both small integers here, as the, lower, uh, the least significant bit is zero, we can still add them and it still remains a small integer. So this means for small integer types, we can actually treat them very, very efficiently when there's almost no special code here. However, we can write bad JavaScript. Here's our add function before. Let, we've we've ran, run it a million times. This just gives the, um, the virtual machine a good indication that this add function is always going to treat integers the virtual machine will generate the code that we just looked at, specific to um, integers. And then what happens if we call it the two strings? The add operator in JavaScript can also, as well as adding integers, it can also concatenate strings. When we throw, uh, when we give two strings to our function, all the assumptions that, our, that the virtual machine had made are now invalid, but they assumed it was gonna get integers, and it's going, oh no, now I have to treat strings as well that will typically cause the, the virtual machine to throw away all the optimized code that it's generated and fall back to some really basic slow code which can work with both integers and strings. So, don't do this. Okay. Is this the case for all virtual machines? Uh, it, it's the majority of them these days. Yeah, when, in the days of um, purely interpreted JavaScript, with none of these optimizations, it wouldn't, this would run the same, it would have no effect. But all the, pretty much all virtual machines do this, um, this now. Can I just ask one yeah. question about this least significant bit used yeah. as a flag? Is that something that they do or something that you do? It's something that they do. So then that basically means you have 31 bits available. Exactly. Them, and 2 is equal to 1 and 4 is equal to 2 and this sort of thing. I mean, who, who, who then interprets? The, the, this is all internal in, in the... Um, in the virtual machine. So you, it's not exposed to you as, as a JavaScript programmer. Yeah. Okay. So the yeah. number types in JavaScript are always doubled? Cur the, officially, the number types in JavaScript are always doubles, but in practice, um, the quality, or programs use integers a lot, mm -hmm. so they have a special case for treating small integers. Mm -hmm. um, we talk a little about box uh, doubles and box doubles and so on. And so on. Um, but yes, this is all internal to, to, to the, the virtual machine. It's about arrays. Arrays in JavaScript, you can put any object you want in there. But this is pretty inefficient if you've got, you know, if we have to have an array of doubles and all of our doubles, in fact, as we are, it's an array of pointers to doubles allocated somewhere else, this is not going to be very efficient. So the net result is that the virtual machines have special cases for arrays when they see that they always contain the same type. Um, so here's an example of how, we'll, how to, now we'll break this. We'll create a new array. This will initially be an empty array. We, we create, set the first element to a small integer. The, run, the, run, the virtual machine will typically say, ah, this is going to be an array of small integers. We had a second small integer, and that's fine. Now if we suddenly add a double, two things, a, the, the array is starting to grow a bit now, so I'll need to allocate more space. And secondly, um, it'll, okay, now I'm storing doubles, not integers, 
and it will replace what was previously an array of small integers with an array of so-called unboxed doubles. These are just the double, the raw double values themselves without the pointer reference. So we're already causing more work. And now, if we, the worst thing we do is add a different type here. We store, add a Boolean into our array. And suddenly the, the array's grown, so it's an allocation. And it's now, uh, the virtual machine will change it now from unboxed doubles into an arbitrary array of objects. So by storing these different types, or, or, the, or modifying the types in the array as we build the array, we've actually caused a lot of work to be done. What's the correct way to do this? You just allocate your array up ahead, uh, ahead of time. It will see immediately, these are, all di these are different types, and it will immediately use the correct, type, uh, the, the correct uh, representation. With JavaScript in this case, sorry, <coughs> when it's not one, two, three, is it, is it just a hash anyway? Or is it actually somehow using the fact that you have consecutive integers? The, the, the arrays are typically represented as actual um, like C arrays with the continuous values. Um, objects provide the, the hash values. They, I suspect that some virtual machines might um, use sort of run, um, do sparse arrays, but you're, you're risking it. If you create, a, if you set the millionth element in an otherwise empty array, it is highly likely that it will allocate a million um, you know, space for a million elements on the stack. So now about, about objects, and particularly classes. Traditional programming languages, um, Java, C, uh, C++, always have a fairly strict class hierarchy, and code is shared between instance objects through these shared methods. So you define methods on the class, then all instances um, of that class can use those methods. How can you do this with, with JavaScript? Everything is very dynamic in JavaScript, the way you create objects, um, through practical inheritance, uh, it's not always clear whether two objects really actually have the same structure or the same, same class. The way that the trick is used is use the order in which properties in the object are initialized to try and get a heuristic guess of what class that object is. Then you have two separate objects whose properties have been initialized in the same order. You can assume that they're the same class and then use the same optimized functions on both of them. Um, this is a thing called hidden classes. Um, I'll give you some references so you can look into this in more depth. I want this quite a high level uh, look we're doing today, but I'll give you references to explore this in more detail. Point here, we're going to create an object. First, we <coughs> set an op, uh, X property on it, uh, and then we set the Y. Here, Two calls to the same thing. We create two objects. Both have X created and Y created. The, the compiler internally will um, know, consider that these two have the same so-called hidden class. The advantage of these hidden classes is that um, there are many of them. A is for showing code. Secondly, the internal representation of the point, once you know its structure, you can say that, well, X is always st stored in a, a slot zero and Y is always stored in slot one. And now when you do property lookup on this, when you do this dot X, if you know you're a point or this hidden class, you can just go straight, ah, oh, that's the thing not in position zero. When asked for, someone asks for this dot Y, that's the value in position one. So you avoid all this sort of hash lookup of strings. How it does rely on the um, this heuristic of using the um, order of setting properties. If I add a new property to P2, here I've added an extra Z coordinate, this will give P2 a, a different hidden class to P1 and you will lose some of those advantages. So, a final, a final type of types going badly. This is a lot of trendy JavaScript libraries um, use um, code that looks like this. You avoid, you drop the new on your constructor, which doesn't matter, but afterwards you might have call a center method to set a center of a circle. You can pass some arguments. When you call center, it returns the same object, so you can then chain multiple calls together. It looks really cool. Is Sorry, the name for, for this kind of API? Um, I call them hips. Sorry? Chaining methods. 
this method, yeah. yeah this method is, uh... Uh, I call them hipster APIs, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't like them. Like jQuery. <laughs> exactly. jQuery is a good example. Leaflet and mapping is, a, is a, another good example. Of, um, um, sometimes they are called them fluent APIs. Yes, oh, that's a good word. Yeah, fluent APIs. Mm -hmm. um, well, these fluent APIs, this same center function or method, when called without any arguments, will return the current value. You might hear it's returning a little array, but we tend we like them to be fluent, so we also like to be able to set centers with an array or um, centers with object literals, where you look at X and Y properties and so on. Now, how is this going to, how does this actually implement it? What do you have to do? This is what the actual implementation of one of these functions tends to look at, look like. You check the arguments, so this is a magic variable that gives you all the access to the arguments of the function as an array. If we've got no arguments, then we return the current center. Otherwise, we do a whole load of runtime type checks uh, to work out what to actually do and return, rather than returning a center now, we return this object so we can use the fluent uh, uh, method chaining. This code, it makes very pretty APIs, but the, the VMs don't have a hope of compiling this into good code. This, the types are, as the types are non-consistent, it has to do these checks each time, and these, as a result, these APIs are pretty, but have poor performance. Fine for small projects, but if you're doing, doing big data, avoid it. So what's the alternative? The alternative is to use more classical... Um, no, oh, if, yeah. if you have to use an API. If you have to use an API, then you're, you're stuck. The API is designed to be slow. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Um, yeah. So to, the, the rules for using types. Well, this is what you should do. You use your types consistently. Don't mess around with things at run, uh, run time. If you're calling a function, if it's all, make sure it's always called with integers and not a mix of integers and strings or objects and arrays. Don't play with types at runtime. They make it very hard for the virtual machines to optimize. Initialize all properties in the constructor and also initialize properties in the same order. This is so that other virtual machines can create these hidden classes. Both V8 and Chakra use the same, same technique. Don't mix types in numeric arrays. When you've got arrays and numbers in them, if you, put, um, if you start changing the types in there, the, the VM will do a lot of work to, to stop using its, old, its efficient representation of numeric arrays and go to using the slower, more general one. What's quite interesting is V8, you can, well, you can run Chrome or V8 with a compiler flag and it will tell you exactly which functions it's optimizing and also when, it's, when it bails out, when it, when it, can't, when it goes wrong. And if you've got, um, if you've got a moderate sized JavaScript library, it can be very instructive. It's a very good check to make sure you're using types consistently. It'll tell you exactly on which functions it's, it's bailing out on. Um, I'll give you a link to a, a very good presentation from Google which explains this in more detail. I'll give you a link at the end so you can go into more detail. Next subject, garbage collection. So when the garbage collector runs in JavaScript, it stops your application. If you're writing interactive applications, games, or in my case, mapping software, and you're trying to maintain a constant frame rate, if your garbage collector runs, and you, a, a typical run can either take 5 milliseconds or 10 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds, that blows your frame budget, you miss the frame, the user perceives a judder, and it creates a very bad effect. Uh, JavaScript naturally generates huge amounts of garbage. We put, create objects and arrays all the time and pass them around. Um, if, we want, if you want to get high performance, then you need to massively reduce the amount of work the garbage collector has to do. So we'll look at a couple of techniques for doing that. Firstly, example of JavaScript being banned. This is a um, fairly classic sort of JavaScript point, uh, function. Uh, we want to calculate the distance between two points. It's a method on the point class. Uh, we pass it another point. We do some calculation. Fine. This looks pretty, um, pretty standard. What's the problem with it is that whenever we want to call this function, we have to create an object. So for 
simple things like this, we're still generating garbage, we're still generating objects. How can we do it differently? Instead, we pass a destructured object. We, we pass the individual parameters. You just pass the parameters that you need to do it. You have the same calculation. And this time, the call is the same, with the same effect, but we don't generate an object. There's, there's a big trade-off here between prettiness and convenience here and performance here. If you care about high-performance JavaScript, unfortunately, it starts to get a bit messy in places. Exactly. And actually, that's a very, very good way of looking at it. The, um, if you write JavaScript, well, you'll see quite interesting examples uh, shortly, actually. But if you write JavaScript like C, then you'll get good performance. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, the virtual machines are really good. We've already talked about the way they have specific code for treating arrays where all the elements are the same type, with the small integers or doubles. So if you write code that operates on doubles, just arrays of doubles, you'll actually get really, really fast. You'll get close to um, C compiled speeds. Sorry, but the yeah. code you're showing us is far better looking than the pretty code. <laughs> um, you know, I disagree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to me, it is. Oh, yeah. Here's another example of. Yeah. You're losing object oriented approach. It's yeah. 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 So here's an example. Uh, um, here's a little puzzle for you, actually. Bad garbage <laughs> too. So I'm going to create an array. I'm going to fill it full of um, integers. So far, the um, uh, so this is currently going to the end of this. This is going to be a specific array of small integers. Now I'm going to do something very bad. I'm going to set one element to an object. And can people tell me the two bad things going to happen here? One related to um, uh, the work that got, what the, Java, the virtual machine does here. So that is what has to happen to the array. So it doesn't make it all pop up. Exactly. And, and second, throw away all what, what it had first. Exactly. And now what effects will it have on the garbage collector? You have to collect the other one. Yeah, you have to collect the other one. Well, what, can you, what garbage is the... Well, when the garbage collector comes across an array of integers, what work does it have to do? I assume we've got still reference to it. Nothing. Nothing, yeah. When we have, to have an array of now miscellaneous things, what does the garbage collector have to do? Exactly. Exactly. So here we see another case where um, if, we're, if we can use constant types in our arrays, we make the garbage collector's life so much easier because it knows it doesn't, it doesn't have to traverse these things for a mark and sweep. Um, okay. So a bit of a gotcha then. Now an example of destructuring data. We saw a little bit of the case in a... Um, in the, in the distance two method earlier. Now it's a more extreme example. Say you want an array of points, a fairly simple thing actually. The classic way to represent it is this. Here, however, we've got um, how many objects in here? And how many objects are created by this piece of code? Four, four. four exactly. Four. Yeah, three, uh, three objects here plus the array. This array is of arbitrary object, so the garbage collector has to traverse it. Can we do better? Well, if we decide to use arrays for our points, then we certainly make the garbage collectors work more easily. It still has to go through the outer array, but it sees each of these arrays of numbers, and so it's, um, it doesn't have to look inside those. However, when, this, when we lose the reference to this, we saw how we've still created four objects. We can go one step further, and if we destructure our data completely, now we have just numbers. Of course, we have to write our code now to iterate over yeah, okay. pairs, but you know, behind a well-written API, this is... So that's more efficient. Exactly, okay. yeah. This is by far most efficient in terms of garbage collection, um, but it's more painful to write, that's for sure. But you could have to erase one for the X and one for the Y, for example. All the X in one array. Uh, you could do that as well. Yeah. 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 Just eliminating the number of objects. 
Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so, you're just saying it's diff more difficult to write. And I'm saying it's actually more difficult to read. It's right. <laughs> 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 yeah. Very good point. Especially. Yeah. 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 <coughs> yeah. Very true. Very true. But remember, with, when you do write code that works on destructured data like this, you can still use all your techniques for writing, you know, good code, good APIs. And as ultimately the, the functions that operate on the destructured data, they're just basically operating on arrays of numbers, of typically four loops, it gets very well optimized by the virtual machine. So good comment at the top of your, your function, good, doc good documentation describing how that works, and you should be able to read it again in six months' time. <laughs> you mean commenting stuff? Um, comment. I oh, don't have time to write comments. <laughs> yeah. So, there's your rules for good gar use of the garbage collector. So, try to avoid it when possible. You can reuse arrays and objects rather than, I didn't give an example of this, but um, uh, it's a fairly a common pattern that um, you pass in an object and you want to compute a slightly different version of that object. You, you pass in a point and you want to add a value to it, translate it by, uh, sort of rotate it around a certain point. If you create a new object each time, you're going to make the garbage collector do more work. So think about, re can you reuse an, in in, uh, an input argument to the function and provide that as output? Consider the destruction of your data. You know the compromise here. Good performance, hard to read and write. There's a great tool for looking at garbage collection in Chrome these days. I'll show you now. It's got this timeline. I'm going to switch. So this is an example. Oh, can you see that? Not very well. Just let me clear this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is a mapping application. These lovely tiles are generated by a group called Stamen in, um, who owns San Francisco. And they've done the whole world as um, these sort of uh, rather lovely wa uh, watercolour tiles. Um, Chrome has got this awesome thing called the timeline. Now let's make that a little bit smaller so it all fits in the um, window. Sorry. Things are being cropped inside. So, when I start this running, what you see here is quite, it's quite a fine line, I hope you can see. This is, this is memory usage over time. Hang on, let me just stop that. <laughs> no, it did generate a bit more. Um, and then I'll just stop. Okay. So, what's happening here is that as we're interacting with the map, memory usage is going up and then the garbage collector is running and we see the memory usage drop. And this sawtooth pattern that we're seeing here is, is absolutely characteristic of an application which is leaking memory. And obviously the steeper the gradient of this, of, of the, the, of the uh, sawtooth here, the faster it's leaking memory, the more often the garbage collector has to run and consequently the bigger pauses that you get in your run uh, uh, when the user's interacting. So virtually a plowed line is the best thing. Exactly, exactly. As opposed to when you're alive. It, it never yes. happens. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, as I was right, it never happens. Um, but it is a good thing when you, you, know, you care about performance, get out this timeline tool built to Chrome and do check that. Does it give you the memory usage of the browser or...? Uh, this is of the, I believe it's just of the Java, the Java and script and machine. Effect, I don't know, is it sandboxed in a way that you don't... I mean, I guess it's only checking that particular page, right? And exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You do get some other stuff here. The oh, count, uh, uh, these counters are a document count, DOM node count, event listener count. These are other, um, obviously, if you're interacting with the DOM, these care, these matter. Um, if you see these values changing, which don't, because this is, at least this application gets that right. Sorry, I don't see those values. I'm sorry, it's, uh, hang on, let me... Um, 19 or 29. Yeah, uh, can I do a? No, it's not going to work on that one. Okay, sorry. This is DOM count is one. Yeah, five hundred nineteen and thirty two. This is not changing as we interact with the map. So at least this application is not leaking uh, DOM elements or event listeners and so on. 
Um, yeah, so here the flat line is good. Um, this is a, a fantastic tool timeline. I'll just show you one final thing on it. Um, we can actually. Oh, hang on, let me clear this. Chrome is the best tool by far. Ever. Um, I, I, both Chrome and Firefox have got excellent debug tools at the moment. Um, Chrome seems to be a little bit ahead in many areas, but Firefox is equally very good. Yeah, I don't think Firefox has this timeline, for example. Um, the inspection of DOM elements for yeah. Firefox, I think, is better. It gives you it's, more margins on it. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 they both have a lot of that stuff. I'm not, yeah, yeah. Um, you can also break down, um, you actually get here a full breakdown of what your code is doing. Sorry, this is quite small. This is, uh, we receive an event from the mouse move. Um, we get to do a function call. Here's a request animation frame callback. And we can break this down and actually see exactly what parts of the code are causing what amount of time. If I can zoom in on that. Can I do that? Yeah, it's just a bit easier. So, um, so we can see exactly how this mouse move event has been done. Anyway, this is, that's something you need to play with. I want to say, just talk about garbage collection at this point. <laughs> So the timeline's there to help you spot problems with that classic sort of. Um, a couple of subjects about ahead of time compilers. So we've already talked about how it's quite it can be quite painful to write high performance JavaScript because you have to destructure your data and so on. You have to be consistent with your types. Ahead of time compilers can help a lot here. I'm putting it into this category. I'm putting in the Google Closure compiler. Uh, that yeah. So in this category, the clo closure compiler, uh, Dart, uh, Dart is Google's new um, sort of JavaScript replacement language, mm -hmm. which it has its own virtual machine, but also it can compile to JavaScript. Mm -hmm. TypeScript, I believe, just compiles to JavaScript. What do these things all look like? There is there, they pretty much look like Java. Um, they give you classical class-based inheritance. They enforce some sort of type checking in your code. They allow you to mark up your code um, to, so you can specify what types should be passed to the functions and some of your return values. This encourages you to be consistent with your types, which, as we've seen, is important for performance. They can do what normal compilers do as well. They can inline functions. If they can reason that realize that a function is only called in one place, they can actually insert it into where it's called from. Um, avo avoiding the overhead of a function call. Specialization is quite neat. They will do techniques that if you, if a function has, say, three arguments of which the third one is optional, and it sees that you never use that third argument to the function, it will eliminate it completely from the, um, from the compiled code. Or equally, if you have a function um, which takes two arguments and the second one only ever has the value one, it will specialise the function so it takes one argument and assumes that that second value is always one. It does really, they can do really quite aggressive optimization on your, uh, on your JavaScript. Um, and the net result is that you don't have to do it, which is great. So you can write good human-readable code um, and let the ahead-of-time compiler do a lot of the work of eliminating um, and constants, inlining, etc. They have special passes for uh, temporary object elimination. This is, for example, we've looked at the case of the API where you had to create a point function, a point object to be able to call the function. Some compilers are clever enough to be able to realize when this is happening and automatically eliminate these temporary objects or automatically reuse, reuse them. Um, this is an ex example of automatic also data destructuring. If, you, um, if you're point passing points with just X and Ys, around, it might actually convert that into two separate arguments. Sorry, question. It seems to be like there's two different approaches. Right? Mm -hmm. You get your code right and then you compile it. Yeah. If you have to choose between the two, which one would you choose? I'd do both. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's what are the pros and cons of the compilers? So the problem with these compilers, and I'll just, I, I'll just go, um, I'll come back to your question in a sec. This is just an example of what, what is a very simple example of what um, Closure compiler code looks like. 
we mark up in Java Suggest doc style comments what exactly the argument, the types of the arguments are, or return types. We also have a whole load of other stuff, interfaces, classes, private, public, protected methods, all sorts, but it's all the same principle. What happens then is the compiler uses this, two, this information to check that your, your code actually can, um, confirms, uh, conforms to these, these types. Um, so if you try to call our sum, which wants integers function, it will, it will compile, it will give it a compile error. Uh, secondly, in many cases, so enforces the type consistency. Secondly, in many cases, it can use the type information to make more aggressive optimization um, of, your, uh, of your code. For example, if a private method specific to a class, if it knows that method will never be called outside that class, it knows the types of everything in that class, it can make a much better job of optimizing it um, ahead, you know, before it's sent to the Java virtual machine than if it had to write a general, um, create more general, generic code. These, these tools, so to come to your question now, advantages and disadvantages, I'm a massive fan <coughs> of the closure compiler in my own projects, but um, it adds quite a lot of overhead to, it's a lot of, quite a lot of extra work to use it. So it's like, well, then development speed slows down up to Java development speed. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you still have closures, and it's still JavaScript, which is nice. It's not quite as bad as Java. But, um, but it does, it is very much, you end up writing a language which is somewhere between Java and JavaScript. Mm. And a lot of the cool, and what it, what it does mean is you get code that performs very well. It's great for large code bases because this sort of type checking makes it, things like refactoring much easier. Um, but you do lose some of the flexibility that JavaScript normally gives you. So um, personally, for all my projects, I use it because I think it's awesome. But realistically, if your project is going to be less than, I don't know, two or 3,000 lines of JavaScript, it might well be more hassle than it's worth. Um, you also, currently, there aren't many people, to be honest, in the world actually using these, these tools. Um, they're not hard to learn, but they are, if, you, if you're, uh, but certainly as it's so different from normal JavaScript development, you will encounter resistance from, from uh, classical JavaScript. My device. next question is yeah. if I propose this at work, uh, if ever I leave, then they're going to have to find people to replace. You know, it just gets really... Absolutely, yeah. You, you, have, to, it's a, you have to decide what your priorities are. Um, I mean, for, for information, um, the Google Closure Compiler is used by Google to do all their big apps. I think G, I've had rumors Gmail is now well over a million lines of, uh, of JavaScript. And to be honest, it's only tools like this that may allow you to write projects of that size. Um, I'm using it in uh, one of the open source projects that I'm working on at the moment. We, we're using it, I should say. Uh, the next, this Open Layers 3 project, which is a kind of Google Maps. The Google Maps also uses the Closure Compiler, by the way. Um, but if, in the case of this open source mapping project, there has been a huge amount of resistance to using the Google Closure Compiler because it looks like Java, because people aren't familiar with it. And people want, there's a lot of pressure to use the, the hipster fluent APIs. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we want the performance. It's hardcore. But if, if you just use the annotations mm -hmm. uh, or comments, I mean, you can just write normal code, test it normally, and yeah. then you compile, I mean, you compile once a day or whatever, you don't need to compile every single time. So yeah, the, for, it to, 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 for it to be able to compile, you need to write your JavaScript in a special way. But it's you really need, it's not, if, I don't know the other, the other annotations, but if you just say that this, this function is going to receive this, mm. uh, these parameters, using just what you saw, I, I don't think it's... Uh, yeah, really the... Um, but you don't what, have to put these annotations. You can right. You can you can do it without the annotations if you want, uh, but the compiler will not generate such good code, and you will lose the, uh, the the type checking part of it. But it will lose the optimization part. It was yes, yes. It will be able to do some optimizations, but not as many. So would the same code be able 
I mean, you're, you're, you're saying you can compile this, but the different mm. compilers, do you need to change the code for different compilers? Yes. Currently, each each of these three right. has its own different way of doing so things. So the overhead, I mean, for actually maintaining this in a real-life real environment mm. gets quite tricky. Well, it's, I mean, it's like a different, slightly different language, to be yeah, honest. I mean, yes. you, know, you get a new developer who doesn't know that, yeah. and you get someone else, and yeah. you rewrite the whole thing. Well, if they want to change from between yeah, these two, yes. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're different languages. Well, the yeah. Not in TypeScript, but different languages. The closure can swallow uh, normal JavaScript. Correct. Yeah. 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 Um, a, a subset of JavaScript. A subset? You're not allowed, you're, there are some things you can't do, like eval, for example. Ah, okay. Yeah. And uh, so. another thing that's great about these compilers is you can write in other languages like Dart and TypeScript, but you can also use the newer JavaScript versions that are not implemented in, in the browsers. Yes. Um, but who would want a project <laughs> to use unreleased version? I mean, if it you, 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 well, yeah, are released, yeah. you, you would go to your boss and say, okay, no, no browser. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're compiling and stuff. It's really the source version. language. Mm. You don't care about the source language. The target language has to be understood you don't by the browser. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, what about CopyScript? I mean, do yeah. CopyScript compiler do something of that or no. nothing at all? Nothing at all. CopyScript <laughs> is, is kind of the good parts of Java with a Ruby-like syntax. Mm -hmm. But it makes your development like fast. Like yeah, it's, it's, a ver it's, a, it's a very pretty language. It's really it's sometimes fast isn't good. Yeah, but it's, it's design, it's a nice-to-write language, and it's um, the it's performance, you need to use the same, you'll need to use the same techniques, like destructure, at the end of the day, it's still JavaScript that's generated, so you need to use the same techniques, being careful about the garbage collection, um, destructuring your data, etc. Whether you write in JavaScript or CoffeeScript. But there are some things that some things that you saw the compiler mm. is not forcing you, but uh, simplifying you to do these things. Uh, yes. For yourself, so. Yeah. Yeah. Same with our Yeah, I'm. So uh, I'm not massively familiar with them. So please correct if I'm wrong. Dart is a project from Google. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, it's their next version of JavaScript, if you like. It seeks to address some of the problems of JavaScript um, while um, remaining familiar to JavaScript developers. So the, the JavaScript, for example, has got a whole mess of types, null, undefined. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I was trying the other day, actually, add, for example. You know, it's pretty obvious that zero plus zero is zero, and empty string plus empty string is empty string. But empty string plus zero, empty array plus one. I mean, what are these? You, it's just a whole minefield. Mm -hmm. If you fancy a bit of Keep fun, yeah, try writing. You write a for loop. You create an array with different types of objects in it: numbers, undefined, nulls, or whatever. And loop over that array. Do a nested um, loop of uh, first one plus second one. In fact, should we do it now? <laughs> <laughs> so you can. Uh, uh, let's do. Let's well, all those things stayed in language because of Microsoft. It's because JavaScript evolved, very simply. <laughs> and it's a lot of the initial... Um, That's a Sunday language. Yeah, the initial That's version of JavaScript was developed by Brendan H. in a, uh, about 10 days. Two weeks, yeah. Yeah. And you want to do a scheme-based language. Yeah. Can keep people see if I, what I'm typing here? Uh, how do I make this bigger? Hang on, let's do it on the... Um, let's change the resolution on this. Probably a quick way to do it. Um, hang on. Mm -hmm. This is your 50-50 <laughs> <laughs> chance. Yeah, I'll do. Right. Okay, now you can see. Right. <laughs> no, that needs to be in the middle there, because we can pop to the side. Get there. Okay. Right, so let's create a few array of different things and find um, how about a function, function and an object. Let's put the object here, okay. Okay, um, now we'll do a quick for loop for i, there are six elements I think, four. 
Yeah. Six. 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 Six.
Um, CoffeeScript is also very untyped. It's very Ruby-like. It's, it's the, whereas all of these three here, they care about types. They give you these sort of classical class-based hierarchies and so on. So these head of time compilers, they, they can help you, but also it's a bit of effort to use them. We talked about that. Um, a final couple of things. I think I've got one more, couple of slides on ways to make your JavaScript go quicker, and then there's a summary, and then we can do more discussion. So another way of speeding up your JavaScript is to not use it. <laughs> use native code where possible. And now we're getting higher and higher level libraries available in JavaScript. If you want to do 3D graphics, use WebGL. 2D graphics, use Canvas. Um, you don't need to manipulate pixels in JavaScript anymore. If you want to make things animate and, and, the, and change position in, in, your, in, your, in your web page, you don't have to have a little loop which updates its position. You can use CSS transitions and animations to do this sort of stuff. In this case, the, the native code written in the browser, or running in the browser, which is doing your work for you, and it's a lot quicker, or often a lot, or usually a lot quicker than doing it yourself in Java, in JavaScript. <laughs> it is quicker, but you're limited in what you can do, I should say. Um, there are a lot of built-in methods into, the, into um, for example, arrays have splice and strice, and strings got char code at, and so on. And with a couple of tricks, um, particularly if you know how to use call and apply in, um, in JavaScript, you can use them. I'll give you an example of this. So here's an example of exploiting some native code. We want to find the smallest uh, value in an array. Very simple loop over, over the code. doesn't get much simpler than that. Um, I know I don't cope with, with the array being empty, by the way, just in case you spot that bug. But that's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty simple JavaScript. Can we do better? The answer is actually very much yes. We can call math.min and apply and give it array as our argument, as an array of arguments. The null is what this will get bound to, so we need to get that first. And here, all of min is being done in browser, by the browser in, in native code. So with a little, this little apply trick, we've replaced what will be interpreted as JavaScript with stuff that's just going to run very quickly. So if you... It's worth looking if you have, this doesn't work for high level functionality, but for low level functionality, get familiar with what's in a JavaScript standard library. Mm -hmm. Look at things that take multiple arguments, for example, and look at these things like apply and call. Is there any of those functions you need to watch out for in your differences in the browsers? The, all, the, all the browsers vary and everything. You're, um, I mean, on the, but they tend to get the basics right, like min. <coughs> I don't know of any bugs in min. But if you look at um, uh, string to char code, for example, uh, where you're converting between integers and, and, uh, and characters or code points, the support for Unicode or not, which right. I, might, I might vary. Um, exactly, so be careful. Is there any, any yeah, limitation on the number of arguments you can pass? Not as far as I know. But I haven't tested it. Because if you have a really big array, I mean, that Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. We'll have to test it, actually. Hang on, let's... Is it now? Let's do it now. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, you've got a question. Um, so let's do... Uh, R A equals... I do the new array of... How big should we make it? Two million? Yeah. Okay. For I equals more I... It's less than array a dot length plus plus i. Um, we'll do a of i equals i. This is not going to be a very interesting one. Okay. Um, and now math dot min dot apply uh, null and a. Okay. <laughs> there is a limit. <laughs> but I don't know what it is. We can go okay. down and find it. I'm not going to do a manual <laughs> binary <laughs> search. <laughs> Life's yeah, too yeah, short. Do that one at home. Yeah. 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 Google might know the answer, but I'm not going to ask it. Um, okay. So, native code. Use native code when you can. Uh, aren't so. you losing uh, inlining optimi uh, optimizations when you use native uh, functions? Not necessarily. Because I mean, this is uh, th this will receive whatever 
object, what, you know, it might be an array of doubles, it might be an array of ar arbitrary um, objects, it could be an array of small integers. Mm -hmm. It will be, it's up to the native implementation of math.min to decode that correctly. Yeah, but if you call it, for example, with an array literal, there's no way to do the constant propagation that would result True. in a direct uh, answer from the compiler instead of having to run the code. You're correct, I believe, yes. But in, in, if you don't know what the your the values of your the arguments are going to be, mm -hmm. then you have to calculate it anyway. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. So. Okay, people have taken this to the extreme. You might have heard of a project called um, mscripten, which takes C code and compiles it to JavaScript. And this sounds pretty weird because everyone who knows C has got pointers, it's got malloc and free for memory allocation. It looks nothing at all like JavaScript. The way that mscripten does it, and it works actually very, so well that a number of game demos, you no know, high performance 3D games game demos, have been ported just by compiling the C code and running it on V8. Oh, wow. um, Is that how Doom was ported? I don't know. I don't know. Um, we can ask Google. Sorry, I can show you. I'll show you um, a demo perhaps after the, the talk. How did it do this? Actually, what happens is, for memory, it allocates a very, very big array of numbers, uh, numbers then you, and then it treats that like a big block of memory. And when the, Jav, when the compile, C compiled to JavaScript stuff runs, it actually allocates, it's got its own memory allocator inside that big block of, I don't know, how many megabytes of memory you give it to. Everything works at the level of small integers and doubles. There's no JavaScript objects floating around, or very few of them. Um, and it works. And actually, it generates code, which is really, um, uh, gets very easily optimized by the um, virtual machines, because there's no, none of these type checks. There's no fluent APIs in there. Um, and it does generally work. Asm.js is a kind of formalization of this. It's, they've worked out what worked really well in mscripten, and taken it out, and said, this now is a potential target language for any language you want to write. You write a compiler, we'll take your favorite language, convert it into asm.js, which is kind of assembly language. Um, it's, um, what's kind of cool about asm.js, actually, is a complete strict subset of JavaScript. So anything that's written in asm.js, I'll show you an example in a sec, is also valid JavaScript and will have the same behavior. Um, so you, it solves the backportability problem as well. Is there something you cannot do? Yes, it's basically very limited. It's uh, to, you get just get the most primitive types, uh, int-like things, double-like things. Um, what else? Probably not much else, actually. Uh, then it's up to you. This is an example of a ASM.js module. And this is both valid JavaScript and valid ASM.js. We put it all in a module here. This little magic keyword um, says the, re the rest of this block is all ASM.js stuff. If, it doesn't if your virtual machine doesn't understand it, it doesn't matter. If it does understand this ASM.js direct directive, then it can compile this code uh, probably quite effectively because it's a simplified version of code. How does it work? Basically, it does little extra manipulations that forces JavaScript to behave like kind of a 32-bit CPU crunching through simple, um, simple operations. For example, the, the bitwise OR with zero here, whatever the value of x is, this will force x to be an integer, a small uh, integer. The, here, in the end here, it also copes with the overflow. If you've got 2 to the um, uh, 30, um, 31 minus 1, and you add 1 to it, and it overflows, this actually will have the correct behavior. Um, the plus here says this is a number, so it's a slightly, or in fact, a double in this case. So this is int, this is double. This return forces the return value to be a double as well. So these, 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 these are the way that the type hints are written. They have the effect that in normal JavaScript, they force the, the, the same behavior, the desired behavior, and anything that understands ASM.js 
will go, ah, okay, that just means x is an integer, and, and so on and so on. Finally, we return actually an object which has where the properties are the functions we've decide, uh, defined, and then we can call it fast.inc1. This will call the inc function, which eventually will be an optimized one. So as in Jess is kind of interesting in the sense that um, as, as we get more and more uh, languages running on the, on the virtual machine, on the Java virtual machine, there's a reasonable chance that we'll start to see Asm.js as a, as a target, as a back-end language for, um, um, uh, for them. Is there a real implementation or is it just a... The, you can definitely use it in Mscriptum and I think there's a, um, there might be a build of Chrome or Firefox with it. I think there's one implementation floating around. At the moment. Yeah. So this is the summary of what we've talked about, very high level. You want to write fast JavaScript, this is what you've got to do. Mum number one, be consistent with your types. Don't do fancy stuff. Yes, you know, take your Java medicine and suck it down. Use classical programming patterns, classic inheritance, and this is what the compilers the decades of compiler technology have been focused on C and Java-like languages. Um, that's what gets optimized well now. If you use the classical programming patterns, um, you will get better performance out of your advanced script. Use native code where possible, kind of goes without saying. Watch out for garbage. And finally, measure stuff. There's, uh, we had a quick look with the Chrome uh, time, timeline tool there, looking at gar garbage collection use. Um, you said other, we mentioned Chrome can also tell you when your functions are de-optimized. Uh, there's a great um, website called jsfiddle.net which allows you to write in different, different bits of, J of JavaScript and benchmark them and run them on different browsers. It's great for finding out actually what works well and what doesn't. Um, so that's how to do it. The few links or resources to look at um, if you just write, round, write down the bit.ly um, code, so I'll send this, put the slides on the, um, on the web at some point. This first one is a fantastic um, set of slides, an OK talk uh, from Google, basically the, guy, the main guys at Google doing V8. And a lot of stuff I've mentioned, like hidden classes, um, uh, de-optimization, all this sorts of stuff. It goes into much more detail, and it's fantastic. I recommend that you just flip through the slides. It's quite a large deck. It'll take you about 45 minutes to do it. Yeah. But it's a huge amount of insight in there. And the speaker is very boring. <laughs> and the speaker is very boring. So, yeah, you can do it. Yeah. yeah. This is very technical. This is a very good blog post from Microsoft talking about what they've done in Internet Explorer 10. Um, it's, it's higher level. And there's not much technical detail. But it does very clear from this that there are many techniques are common between the two um, and it gives you a good idea of what IE 10 needs if it's going to um, run your JavaScript well. It's pretty much the same stuff as V8 needs. Um, finally, very simple, uh, an older post has right um, real-time, low garbage real-time JavaScript. This just explores a few more techniques, what exactly you need to do for destructuring, for reusing objects and arrays and so on. Um, so, go read the read these and go write fast JavaScript. Thank you very much. <laughs>